Hello and welcome to all Institute personnel. Recently, as part of our investigation into the North American Commonwealth, I had the opportunity to speak with Marco Close, the author of the Frontline series of books, as well as many other great reads. Now, I am by no means a professional journalist or book reviewer, so we had more of a casual conversation about what it's like writing military science fiction, world building, subverting audience expectations, and what it's like to see your story adapted into a Netflix show. If you're a fan of Frontlines, the next book in the series is available tomorrow, while the audiobook version is coming out in February. I believe there was a slight delay there from the time we recorded this, so ignore whatever we say in the actual interview. The book is out tomorrow, audiobook in February. You'll find the links in the description. My thanks to Mr. Close for giving the Templin Institute some of his valuable time, and I hope you enjoy our conversation. I'll keep this kind of casual. Uh, sure. And just yeah, happy casual is fine with me. Yeah. Um, I guess actually this isn't really part of the interview, but something I wanted to mention. Uh, it's been funny because I have very strong opinions when it comes to military science fiction and how, you know, in my opinion, they should be written. <laughs> And uh, we've done a few videos, like, based on those uh, opinions of mine. And every single time in the comments, there'll be, you know, a few people saying, you know, you should really read uh, the Frontline series by Marco <laughs> Close, because he is doing exactly what you're saying. So I think this uh, interview is going to really appeal to them. Kudos, kudos for getting the last name right on the... on. You know, like right away, because mo most people don't. <laughs> I'd love to take credit, but I I listened to the audiobooks, so. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they I... actually, it's when they did the first audiobooks of the first book, they um, uh, sent the the masters of the CD. They sent me my copies of the audiobook, and my wife starts listening to them, and they mispronounce my name in the introduction, and she's <laughs> like, "Have them fix it," and I'm like. The CDs are already pressed. It's no big deal. She's like, it is a big deal. It's your name. So, <laughs> so I sent an email to my editor and said, well, they kind of got this wrong, and they profusely apologized, and they just, they just redid the that version of the audiobook, just the new intro and and uh, and the outro, you know, with the proper pronunciation. But she, my wife's like, it is a big deal. It's your name. I don't fix it. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, that worked out great for me because I I did double check the audiobook just before we went live here. I'm like, okay, I'm pretty sure it's close, but I'll I'll. Uh... Yeah, I had That's to cool. check something too. I had to check the pronunciation of the city that is the capital of the NAC. Oh yeah, which, which city is it? It's it's Minot, North North Dakota. Minot, North Dakota. Why why yeah, Minot? Because it is the closest suitable big-ish city to the geographical center of North America. Oh, okay. I, I, lo I love it. <laughs> I was looking at the stop putting <laughs> it's, these it's, things. It's kind of like a ceremonial thing. Like I want to think they they put like a little they used that that city and kind of expanded it and made like a ceremonial, you know, new, you know, head of government place and wherever where the president stays and whatnot. But you know, I, I want to think that the the old capitals are still like administrative centers for that particular section of the of the NAC because it's so damn big. Um, and then Minot is just for the ceremonial stuff like swearing in new presidents and you know all that. But it's it's like it's like what Germany used to be like Bonn was the, you know was the capital for a while and then now it's now it's berlin again like they, those those countries where you have like one capital that's just for show and the other one where the work gets done yeah so, you're speaking my language 100 percent. i i uh this is what my the entire Templin institute channel is built on just that sort of world building um mm -hmm. i think i'm all good to get going well you know i'm always right i'm gonna throw up or faint in the middle of these things but i think i'm good so <laughs> all right so i wanted to to ask about um I don't know what it's like for you, but with me, you know, starting a project can be the hardest, scariest part. So in those early days when you decided, okay, Terms of Enlistment or whatever it was called at the time, this is the novel I'm going to write. Like, What do those first few days or weeks look like? Were you starting with an outline or, or writing characters or coming up with the world or, or did you just start writing? Now I have, I've, I've learned my lesson and I've, I've, pl I'm, for the last, oh, I don't know, four months is up to seven books now, and the new series. I'm working on the third one now, so this is going to be the tenth book. And I've got, I've really kind of honed my process to where, where before I start, I take, you know, lots of notes and make myself like a chapter timeline. You know, it's just a line or two per chapter, like the beats that need to happen in each chapter. And and a lot of times I I just stray from the 
initial outline a great deal, but uh, usually, you know, it, it helps to have, like I call it my, my, my waypoints, you know, my GPS, because mm-hmm. uh, you have to have like, kind of like the, the beats that, you know, the beats that you want to hit, and then you just kind of uh, divide it all up into chapters. And sometimes you run really long in a chapter and you need to split it up, or sometimes the chapter is too short and you need to put it together with another one. But usually I, I roughly stick to my, to my outline, but I didn't do that for the first two Frontlines novels because it was of the circumstances in which they were written, especially the first one, because the first one was a. I went to this workshop um, on Martha's Vineyard called Bible Paradise, and uh, it was it's an invitation only workshop, so you had to send in you know either short stories or you know a few chapters of a novel, and it was like I was made aware of the workshop a few weeks before the application deadline and I didn't have anything. So I needed to bang out something very quickly. Um, so I was thinking about what I really wanted to write about, you know, the kind of thing where people tell you, you know, if you can't find the novel that you like, like you with military science fiction, if you can't find the novel that you uh, want to read in that particular genre, you just got to write it yourself. And uh, I wanted to have a, a way to kind of work in my own military experience from way back when, before I forget it all, you know, all those little details. Right. So I was like, why don't I write? Well, at first, at first I wrote a fantasy, you know, a few, few chapters of a fantasy novel, and I showed it to my wife and to read, to get her opinion. And she's like, yeah, maybe you should try something else. <laughs> <laughs> so then I, uh, I, did, I came up with the idea of doing the, the uh, military science fiction novel. And, uh, and I basically just, because I had this really short amount of time to get something in before the deadline, I just kind of, winged it for the first few chapters and that's what i took to the um to and that was accepted and uh, i went to the workshop and then those first few chapters that i took with me to get critiques on and whatnot they ended up being you know the first few chapters of this novel so for the first one i really really winged it i just kind of you know wrote off the cuff and it was a it was an advantage in a way but it was also a disadvantage in terms of world building it was a an advantage in that I left myself so much space to flesh it out later. Like I didn't go into the details exactly in the first book, so I couldn't contradict those details later when I really had to, you know, crank down the world building when it turned into a, it was supposed to be a trilogy and now it's up to seven books. So you can tell how that went. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm glad it was, I kept it so loose in the first few books because it left me a lot of elbow room to expand later on, but it was also a hindrance because I had to retcon a lot. And then, you know, read back through my own books because I didn't really, you know, make it early on when I was inexperienced and, you know, I'm writing my first novel or two and, you know, didn't really have my workflow down. So there's, there's a lot of things I had to, had to kind of retcon or, or, you know, quietly drop. <laughs> so it's been, it's been a, that was a hindrance and a blessing both, like I said, but then I got into the groove later on for the, for the later novels and I had my, my started to develop my own system here and now it's like all it's it, it doesn't look like much of a system but I, i've got whiteboards in the office with sticky notes color-coded sticky notes and i switch them around you know to uh, you know per character and then where they fit in the narrative and make sure that all the timeline matches up and one thing doesn't happen before the other thing happens that depends on the first thing and so on so i've, I've got my system down now but it took me it took me a few novels but the first one was just just basically, you know, I wrote, I brought the first three chapters to the workshop. I got crits on it. And then one of the editors who was there, who was the first one to critique it actually was, you know, the, the acquisitions editor of a really big house. And, uh, he, he, uh, was done with his critiquing and he said nice things about it. And he said, uh, why don't you send that to me when it's done? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> so I, so I finished it as quickly as I had started it. It was done in like a wrote that in, in you know a few months and then i sent it off to him um and and nothing ever came of that but it it was i had this motivation to just get it out and then i was while i was waiting for a response i was like well I might as well write the second one because if they want the first one then i'll have another one to sell them and uh, it didn't work out with that house but eventually that that you know, when i got the the uh, deal on the first two books because i had the second book already ready to go i was able to sell them two in a row so um and now it's 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 now I've got two series going and now kind of like, you know, the machine is kind of humming along because once you've done, once you're immersed in a series, you also have a lot more uh, to work with that you've built in the last, you know, in the previous novels, you know, yeah, bigger cast of characters to revisit and more settings and, and you get better at the craft too. So it's, it's, 
it's not as it's simultaneously more work now than it was and it's also easier if that makes any sense no no that makes perfect sense um do you remember any of the things that you retconned because from my perspective reading those first two books then going into the the further ones it all seems completely seamless to me i was very careful to not retcon any of the major stuff um like the, the PRCs I was able to kind of expand on in the later books, you know, the size of them and the different mm -hmm. categories that wasn't in the first book. And then, you know, I, I, I flubbed a little with the, because I wasn't very thorough in the world building in the beginning and I didn't take the copious notes that I take these days where I kind of make myself like a series Bible, you know, where I have all the, the, um, um, and by the way, you know, I love paper and pen, but if you have to keep track of a series that spans seven books, you need something like OneNote where you could just, you know, have everything online and just look it up yeah, at once without search. having to drag like three or four, you know, notebooks off the shelf and then just kind of leaf through them to see where you put the name of that specific ship in that specific scene. You know, it's better when because now, now I have it all ca categorized, you know, the tech, the characters, birth dates. So I can't screw up, you know, like I <laughs> did a little bit early on when, you know, and, and readers are really good at, especially military sci-fi readers. They're really good at catching inconsistencies or, or like oh in this book you said this 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 uh you know a system was this far away and in this book you said it was that far away which one is it and uh, so you really got to got, gotta get your ducks in a row with if you want to write military sci-fi because the fans are really meticulous about you know stickers for detail oh yeah no I, I can believe that absolutely i mean i am too but i don't have the the military background which i i guess um Actually leads to my next question, which was, um, you served uh, in the West German military uh, towards the end of the Cold War. Now, you mentioned that you're writing your own experiences uh, before you forgot them. And I have to imagine, yeah, having that military background makes it a lot easier to write good military science fiction. But do you think it's necessary? For, to write military sci-fi well, is it necessary to have served? Yeah. Uh, I don't think so, um, because I've got friends who were never in the military who write very good military sci-fi you know, writer friends of mine I, I don't know if you've any read any of uh, john scalzi stuff or uh, uh linda nagata i might uh, have been know, terrible they, with names <laughs> linda nagata is wrote you know the uh the red and those two follow-up novels is a really good military sci-fi series uh, uh martha wells i don't think martha wells was in the military um but i know a bunch of people who write military sci-fi who write it well and it doesn't seem to hurt them greatly that they didn't serve now now you can tell usually like if you've served and you know the details of, of things, like there's some stuff that takes place in the military that it seems routine to you when you've done it and you know what it's like but you don't get those those details you know those sensory details or those those uh um, um, procedural details, you know, like it, it's it, the the look and feel of it. You don't quite get it as a as a civilian if you haven't served because you've never experienced it. So you know, people tend to not put those in if they don't know them. Like you know, the stuff like everybody has their boot camp sequence, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's almost like it's almost a staple in the genre. But but it feels it it's either either abbreviated or it doesn't quite feel as as realistic from people who haven't served but it, it doesn't mean it can't still be really good because you know you don't have to like Heinlein was in the military but he was uh, in the navy mm -hmm. so he was never an infantry grunt but he can write really well about you know uh, infantry combat so it didn't seem to hold him back any so you can read a lot and watch a lot and talk a lot to people and you can you can approximate it easily enough to where it's where it's it's competent and it won't be noticed by most people it's just like the hardcore you know the veterans or the hardcore you know readers that they're, they're gonna notice like few things um i always mention uh, um uh, john john scalzi has this really good you know old man's war series but there's a scene that i always mention that when people say you know what's an example of stuff that you know a civilian wouldn't know that doesn't really happen in the military that seems so like non-consequential when you read it like there's a the, he has got this boot camp scene where the instructor demonstrates the safety features of the weapon by aiming it at a recruit and pulling the trigger and nothing <laughs> happened. And, and all the all the people who have served are like, no. <laughs> not, that yeah. never like like as a civilian, you just kind of read it and it's like, oh, that's kind of neat. But as a as a soldier or, for, or former soldier, you're like, there is no friggin' way any any drill sergeant or or uh, you know, drill instructor in basic training will 
allow anybody to aim a weapon at anybody else, you know, safety features or not. That is that is something that will get you in, in huge trouble. Um, so yeah, like if you you read that scene as a civilian, oh, like that's neat. And you read that scene as a, as a soldier or a former soldier, and you go, yeah, no. <laughs> but but it doesn't mean that the novel isn't very good. It's a really good novel, and he gets it mostly right. But it's just. You know, the, it's the sensory details, like I said, that you tend to get more right or you, you actually put them in in the first place if you've been in the military and you kind of gloss over them or you do the, the tropey stuff that you know from, from reading novels or, or watching movies that, you know, everybody kind of knows. I mean, you can watch documentaries and then get a really good idea of what it's like, but, you know, some stuff you just don't um, get from, from reading a book, like, you know, what it's what it smells like on the parking lot when you step off the bus and you walk onto the you know, the footprints they painted on the ground, you know, and, you know, or what, you know, what the, what it feels like when you walk into that building for the first time. And, you know, like just the, like, like you know, that Robin Williams scene in, in, in Goodwill Hunting, where he says to, to, to Matt Damon's character, who's a really brilliant kid, but he's never been out of Boston. You know, and he's just cocky as 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 all hell, and he tells him like, uh, you know, you. Uh, I bet you can tell me any everything about Michelangelo. You know, his relationship with the Pope, his life, his death, everything. But you can't tell me what it smells like in the Sistine Chapel because he's never been. You know, it's he's yeah. never been out of Boston. So you're just a dumb kid, and my sub. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I got it, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're just a, you're just a kid. You, know, you, you you can't tell me what it smells like in the Sistine Chapel or what it feels like to look up at that ceiling at that beautiful ceiling and same with the military you know you can tell me all about warfare and you can you can you can fake it really well but you can't tell me what it smells like in the parking lot when you step off the bus and your instructors are waiting for you there in the line you know to receive you to that psychological game that starts you know on that when you try to turn civilians into into you know soldiers you know mm-hmm. they got to they got to break down the civilian part of you and just kind of rebuild it and as part of it it's all like the psychological game but it's that that's something that you can't get from, from reading books. So it's, it, it, military people tend to put that in more, and 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 but it's only noticed really by other military people. It's the most readers would read it, read over it and they'd be like, okay, sure, well, you know. But so it's it's to answer your question I, that I just answered in a really long roundabout way. <laughs> no, it's not. It it helps, but it's not necessary to write good military sci-fi. Well, um, is having that that military experience and, and knowledge of how it all works, does it ever sometimes work against you where you want something to happen in the story or you yes. want a character to do something, but it would never happen in the real military? Yes, yes, yes. That's that's why I had to go and, and take young Mr. Grayson and give him a job change because um, I wanted to keep his rank progression realistic. Like, you know, what well, you get military sci-fi novels where, you know, the, the young lieutenant starts in book one and then she is a, you know, five-star fleet admiral by book five and has yeah. all the medals that the military can bestow on her. And that's unrealistic. Like, like uh, Andrew Grayson doesn't even become an officer and only then he becomes an officer kind of by accident. And it's, it's not until book four that they kind of force a commission on him. Um, but I, so I wanted to keep that rank progression realistic, and also the, the, you know, I, I, you know how how some people kind of like take their their protagonist, and he's like always in the in the earth shaking at the earth shaking moment. He's always like at the at the focal point of decision making, or like he he's the he's the uh, the little weight that tips the scale, like firing he's the, one the torpedo the to blow up the Death Star. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and if you read through front lines, there is, I, and I did that very deliberately. I never made him the deciding factor in a battle, like in, in the overall battle. Like he's never the 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 win or lose factor. Like the battle, every battle that he's in, the battle would have gone roughly the same way if he hadn't been in it. You know, he's just doing like what a, a line grunt does. He's just you know, doing his job to the best of his ability. But you've made but sure to never... give him a, a great view every single time. Yes. And and that's another thing. Like I want to give him a realistic job. So that's why I kind of wrote myself into a corner in the second in the in the first book, because I had made him um, uh, you know basically just a, a network operator on a on a starship. And then after after I was I decided to write more books in the series, I was like, okay, this is not gonna be a very interesting series <laughs> if he's just gonna be a, a, a sys admin on a starship for the entire series because all he's gonna see in front of him is a console for the for the duration of the series. So I had him do a career change where he went to uh, become a combat controller because I didn't wanna make him 
and couldn't make him so high in rank that he's always like with the generals and the admirals where the decisions are made. So, but we have to see, you know, the reader has to see slightly a little bit of the bigger picture instead of just just this reactive you know all this stuff showed up in orbit and we don't know why and now i'm I'm gonna have to get ready for a fight he needed to be more aware than the regular soldier on the battlefield of what's going on around him but not in an artificial way so i I was going through the list of jobs that he could be doing and uh, and you know then i made him a combat controller because you know like calling down airstrikes and all that stuff Uh, fire support um, because then he has an excuse to be tied in into the bigger picture but he still gets to be enlisted and on the ground and with the rest of the grunts so i thought that was the perfect job for him so that we don't just have this 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 tunnel vision of him just being on the battlefield you know he knows more than the private next to him what's going on so the reader will know because it's first person Um, but it's not it doesn't feel he's not as constrained but it doesn't feel um artificial you know it doesn't feel like a sleight of hand thing that i'm doing where you, or just he just happens to walk by the cic when they discuss this or that like he's an integral part of it but it's mm-hmm. in a real from a from a military standpoint it's a realist he has a reason to be there that's part of his job without it without the, the military readers reading it and going oh come on you know he shouldn't be there he's just a he's just a freaking staff sergeant you know so uh, I found the perfect job for him for that. I was pretty proud of myself for that one. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I mean, I, I love Star Trek and I love Star Wars, but it always feels like the Rebellion or Starfleet or whatever, there's only like five people in the entire service and the rest of everybody's just kind of like watching them do all the action and, and save the world over and over again. So yeah, Frontlines is, yeah. is great at, at uh, flipping that on its head. Yeah, I try. I tried to reverse a bunch of tropes intentionally with that. Um, and and for the most part, I think I pulled it off okay. Um, but yeah, I wanted to go kind of against the grain of what what you know people usually do in military sci-fi, and I just can't. I just can't. I don't know about you, but I can't stand the whole like jingoistic. You know, the uh, they go in, they blow stuff up, everybody high fives, and you know it's all about the guns and the explosions, and <laughs> and, and it, that's that's not what you know a soldier's life is like. Like the fights are kind of rare actually, but you can't just write about the the day-to-day stuff you can work in the day-to-day stuff because it makes it more realistic but you can't just write only about it because that would be really super boring but if it's all just wall to wall you know studly mcmasters jumps in with his core core of elite you know space paratroopers and they just waste everything and blow all the aliens to crap and then they all go home and and you know everybody's happy i mean that's that's like that's really dull for me to read like that's not the and and military sci-fi i don't want to say it's mostly that but there's a lot of that and uh it's not it's not what i wanted to write well it helps make the world feel i guess more plausible and more more real to know that there's this big apparatus that when those brief points of action do erupt that it's all kind of earned or or makes sense i suppose right yeah all right. Um, so I want to go briefly back um, to your experience in the in the Western military. Um, now, I, I, I'm a fan of Cold War history, but there are gaps in my knowledge. But to the best of, of uh, what I remember, West Germany didn't operate any interstellar space fleet to defend its extrasolar colonies. So when you're yeah, writing... That's, that's classified. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, when you're... <laughs> When you're writing beyond the boundaries of your own experiences and you have to talk about what it's like to be on the bridge of a, of a space carrier or drop on a planet, how do you keep those moments as believable and, and grounded as like the boot camp experiences? Well, you kind of mix the stuff that you know with the stuff that you don't. Like, I don't know what it's like to jump out of a, a you know, a, to, to, to have do a ballistic drop out of a starship's, you know, a missile tube and then, you know, drop it to orbit. I do have an idea what it feels like when you jump out of a perfectly good airplane just with, with a piece of, of, of silk <laughs> on your back. Um, so you, you work the stuff that you don't know, but you just kind of pr- imagine what it would be like in with the stuff that you do know. So you put in, you know, Andrew's thoughts as he is getting loaded into that missile tube to launch onto the planet with the biopod. And you combine it with the, the feelings that you know you had when you did your first jump on an airplane, you know, like the, the, the uncertainty of it and the, and the, you know, and the, the, the butterflies and all that stuff. And you just kind of blend them together. And then it, and then it reads, you know, realistically, hopefully if you, if you pull it off. Well, I, I think it absolutely did. I'm also curious though, you go into a lot of, um, technical specifications and and the way you describe the dropships and, and starships like 
from my perspective, it feels, yeah, of course that's how it works. That all seems, you know, realistic to me. Are there, like, technical books you've read or, or some sort of resource you've, you've looked at to, I'm not sure, make all these things feel believable, not just relying on all your own experiences? Um, well, you know, I read a lot of sci-fi in general, and, and I read a lot of military history, and I was kind of just kind of, like, trying to extrapolate what the technology would be like. Like, I, I, I look at what we use now and what it looked like 100 years ago, and then I try to imagine what it would look like a hundred years in the future, and, and and I know I usually fall short because I don't think ahead far enough. Because hmm. in a hundred years, we're going to be way beyond even even where where I try to put my my tools. But I also try to explain that with the um, the bureaucratic inertia of the mil, you know the military bureaucracy, where everything that has to be approved for service goes through this long and arduous process, and by the time you put it into service, it's already several generations behind. So I, I kind of ex- try to explain it away with that. Like if, if, if I fall short with my predictions as far as weapon systems or, you know, space flight is going to be in a hundred years, then, you know, it's part, part of that is because the military likes to play it safe and, and, you know, not, you know, just, just try to, they don't try to stay up like with computer technology, the stuff that you see on a, on a Navy ship is ludicrously out. Like right now on the modern Navy ships is already ludicrously outdated because they don't, uh, but but they're secure systems, you know. But they're mm-hmm. they're they they test it until they know it works, and then they keep the proven stuff as long as they need. But they don't upgrade their you know CPUs or their monitors or whatever every year like uh, you know Joe Average does. So if you look at a at a, at a you know Navy CIC or whatever the the equipment in there from a from a technical standpoint is is already outdated compared to what you know your regular computer users use. But it's it's. So it's so I, I try to kind of bring that in too, is like that they always have to fight the bureaucracy and the military, you know, doesn't always make the smartest decisions when it comes to like purchase or upgrades or whatever. And then you have, uh, then I had the chance actually when I wrote, because um, uh, I built these time gaps in between the novels so I could, you know, jump ahead and carry the story ahead and leave myself elbow room in between the novels so mm-hmm. I can put in more material later. But um, then I also had a chance, like after we, you know, went to war in Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, in the real world, and we had, and I kept writing, reading all these articles on the military publications, you know, about, you know, material fatigue, how they were beating up material that was never meant, that was meant for like a quick ground war in Europe, and for a few months of deployment before it gets overhauled, um, if it survives the the war, you know, and it was we they were just grinding up material that was never designed to be used in that sort of environment for that duration, you know, for like years and years at a time. So, you know, they had stuff falling apart of them on them, you know, rotor blades of helicopters eroding from the sand. And, and, you know, it's, it's stuff that we never thought about before we went in there is that the, the gear, the military gear was not designed for that kind of use. And so I, I built that into front lines where later on in the novels, you know, they're, 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 uh, you know, they're garrisoning, you know, uh, the, I don't want to take anything away from, you know, I don't want to drop any spoilers for people who haven't seen her series yet or read it yet. But, but, you know, when they're garrisoning this, this planet from orbit and they're doing these patrol flights and really lousy conditions mm-hmm. that just beat up the drop ships. And then they, you know, they I, I built it in where they actually have a, a, a catastrophic failure of a, of a drop ship in the middle of a mission because of material fatigue, you know, the ship's only three years old, but it's been flown for like, you know, 2000 patrol hours in really, really abysmal weather. Um, so, you know, it was never meant to be used that hard for that long. And then it just kind of, even though it's almost new at all, and then it just kind of fails and it's part of the story. It becomes part of the story. So it was, it, it gave me this extra, extra layer of realism that, you know, if you've been to Iraq and Afghanistan, or you've been in the military period and you've, you've had to make do with stuff that's, 20 years old and got patched up several times and you have to take it into combat, you know, people will recognize that and go, oh yeah, you know, that makes sense. That's how it would be. Absolutely. Yeah, I always feel like um, real life is, is the best resource. We do a, a bit of uh, creative writing on our, on our channel sometimes and I have no idea what's plausible. So my rule's always been, if it's happened in the real world, it can happen in this, whether it's just adapted to fantasy or, or science fiction or, or whatever. Right. Um, yeah. So, um, like I said, with my channel, uh, I'm I'm a sucker for like world building and 
you know, basically, like, I, I love writing everything but the story, and I'm, I'm completely lousy at that. <laughs> um, so, you know, if I were writing front lines, it would have started with, you know, Andrew Grayson in a library, and he'd be saying to himself, you know, wow, I had no idea that the uh, North American Commonwealth had a bicameral legislature, and it was founded in 2024. <laughs> And, you know, by book five, he would have, you know, missed the bus to boot camp. He'd still be in that library just reading out <laughs> pointless facts. But what I noticed on my reread of the series um, is that you've actually managed to get in so much context and exposition about the world. So he might as well have been in that that library the entire time, except I didn't even realize all these things were being kind of sprinkled throughout. Is there a, a trick to, to that to keep out those long, boring exposition dumps? Um. Well, it's, it's kind of like you have to go by your gut feeling. If you, let's, let's put it this way. If there, there's some, some rules of thumb that some writers use, like for example, there's one that says, you know, if it's boring to you to write it, it's boring for the reader to read it. Like I go through my, my, uh, my drafts and I read the stuff that, that uh, I've written so far. And I know that it's, good when i keep reading and it, I, and I don't get yanked out of the story in any way and, and, and I, I don't think well this is boring like if i if i you know pick up my books at any point you know the later ones especially and then i start reading i'm you know if i'm <laughs> and i wrote the the stuff i know i wrote it but but sometimes I, I i read through the stuff and i couldn't can't quite remember how that chapter went but i read <laughs> through it again and i'm like wow it's actually really good <laughs> so it's it's like uh um you um you have to, I mean, exposition you have to do, but you do, don't have to do it in a boring way. Like uh, some writers, you know, like, like, um, oh, the guy who wrote the, uh, the, the um, or the, the, these conspiracy novels that were turned into a movie with Tom Hanks. I forgot what they're called now. Oh, uh, I know the sequel, Angels and Demons. I don't know the first yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> is it Dan, Dan Brown? Is it, yeah. Is it Dan Brown? No, it's not Dan Wait, Brown. Wait, uh, was that the Da Vinci Code? Da oh, the Da Vinci Code, yes. Okay, the yeah. Da Vinci Code. You know, they and and I know that people think they're good books because they sell a lot. I've, I've, but but you can totally tell that he's the kind of writer who is like, okay, I've I've done all this research on what a cardinal's ring looks like, and I'll be damned if I don't put in all eight pages of my research into that <laughs> book right now. So you have this the action coming to a screeching halt where where the main character kisses the cardinal's ring and then goes off into an, an, you know, a two and a half page exposition on what the ring looks like, the ring's history, why it's, why it's, why, why it has those symbols and what the symbols mean and all that. And, and you, that screeching sound you hear in the background is the action just coming to a complete stop. You know, and you gotta, you gotta uh, kind of, and, and it's something that you get with experience, I guess, when you, the, the more you write and the more you read, mm -hmm. the more you get kind of an ear for it or an eye for it rather. It's what, exposition you can dump in naturally and how to and what exposition if you dumped it in is just gonna it's just gonna slow you down and just kind of like put the then the chapters like dead in the water um so i always tend to err on the side of of you know just trickling it in slowly kind of naturally instead of like the as you know bob you know the such and such spaceship has a displacement of blah 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 yeah. um you know you you have to make it kind of feed it naturally into the story like in the thoughts of the character that or in in a dialogue that is not just there for, i mean it's there for exposition sort of but you can kind of streamline it in in a way that that feels natural instead of making it feel like exposition these big chunks of ingredients like you know you always want to blend everything it's like with with cooking when you bake you know you dump in the flour and the sugar and you don't want the clumps you know, you got to stir out the clumps and these big, big clumps of exposition, you got to smooth them out and spread them out if you have to, but don't just leave them in as clumps because it'll, it'll mess up the recipe. Well, I think you nailed it because, uh, yeah, in, in trying to write an episode on the NAC for, uh, for our channel here, I remember thinking the last time I'd read Frontlines was, I think, 2018 when the, when the previous book came out. And I was like, oh, I'm going to have a lot of questions because I'm not sure if, if the book goes into detail on all these things. And when I was taking my notes, I was like, oh, wow, there's actually way more here than I than I remembered. So that <laughs> yeah, was just, uh, just great very, for me. Very carefully dispersed throughout the books. Mm -hmm. um, so when I first got into Frontlines, I, I don't know what year it was, but I guess it doesn't matter. Um, I was I was trying to find like a good science fiction series and I would, I would start, you know, book after book and, and they were all fine, but weren't really doing it for me. And then with, with uh, Terms of Enlistment, it's still one of my favorite parts in the series, but um, I'm reading it and I'm like, okay, yeah, the writing's, the writing's fine, but uh, I, I know where this is going. 
Um, Grayson's in boot camp. He's going to get selected to join the Navy, and then he's going to go out and mm-hmm. fight some space bugs. Um, but then when he's assigned to the Territorial Army, I was just as mm-hmm. surprised as he was, and it ends up like turning into this story that I didn't know I wanted, but ends up being like amazing and, and still one of my favorite sequences in the in the whole series. So, is it tough, kind of maybe balancing? what the audience expects. Like you don't want to disappoint anybody, but also subverting expectations in a way that doesn't leave anyone feeling kind of tricked or disappointed. Oh yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a, and and especially in military sci-fi, because as much as people say they want something new, if you go too far off the formula, uh, Mm -hmm. people are like, Oh, this isn't, this isn't what I expected. This sucks. You know, like, like with the, uh, um, I wanted to invert, a lot of the tropes and I didn't and, and this is this goes back to I didn't want to make him the deciding factor in any single battle you know like he ne- he never saves the day he may save lives here and there you know by by you know his his actions on the ground but he does not influence the the outcome of the battle in any in, a, in any major way where mm-hmm. you can't point to him and say he's the hero of the day and he you know everybody picks him up and carries him around on their shoulders and you know he's just you know you the the every man who does the job as well as he can you know he's, I mean he's competent at what he does but he's not you know super grunt so I wanted to have it have that also ref, reflected in what happens to him like like it would be too neat to just you know he he joins the navy and he goes up and they blast space bugs and whatnot I wanted to have a that that little trope reversal and it didn't land a hundred percent with most with with all readers because one of the critiques I got for the first book is that it kind of reads like two books. Oh, really? Is that you know from 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 that the first half where he's on Earth, people were like you know that's that's the more interesting part. I wanted to read more of that, and then he just goes off into space and does the you know fi- fighting the, the 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 aliens in space. And and I recognize the validity of that because I can see the seam in the book where you know you either make the jump with the story or you go. I wanted to read more of this stuff of him on Earth, and 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 but I was like, if I stay with this. It's gonna be another dystopian novel that takes place on Earth, and I wouldn't have the the room to, you know, really go out and you know with the with the colonies and whatever, and going going among the stars and and having this first contact experience and all that. That there wouldn't have been this the 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 space for a for a series at that time. I wouldn't have been able to pull it off because I didn't have the you know the scope for it yet in my head you know where it could go from there and, and what i could do with it so i needed to get him off the planet but i want i didn't want to make it obvious and i wanted to it to be a little you know take a few left turns here and there so that when you read it you don't just go oh i know what's going to happen mm-hmm. you know like you like you just said so it's it's it was it was wholly intentional in and in trying to fit it into this whole you know not not swimming with the, I mean, going kind of against the trope, but still trying to meet genre expectations because people are going to want the whole going into space, meeting aliens of one shape or form, and and you know being in some in, involved in some conflict because there's absolutely no drama to them meeting friendly, happy aliens, and they all have have drinks together at the yeah. at the you know Star Wars cantina. You know, there's no uh, there, there's no drama to that, so you know it has to be a conflict of some sort. But you can you can try to to uh, kind of work uh, work the tropes in a, in a manner that that kind of makes the story a little bit more unique. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I I I have to think back on my initial thoughts to the to the first book because rereading it, I mean, it seems to just set up the context for for future conflict in the PRCs and and future conflict in the, across the colonies. So, I mean, it, it, on rereading it, it seems to flow a lot more seamlessly than maybe it did in just that first book. I I can't remember what I thought, but uh, okay. Um, Sorry, I'm last track of my questions here. Bear with me. Oh, okay. Um, so talking about aliens, um, <clears throat> I mean, like I said, I, I love Star Trek. I, I love Star Wars. But so many times the aliens in those series are just like a guy in a mask or a guy with some weird makeup. Whereas mm-hmm. the Lankies are unlike anything I've seen in science fiction, at least to my knowledge. Um, how did the process of, of designing those creatures kind of work for you? Did you just kind of come up with it on the spot or, or did you do some... Like, how do you design an alien from scratch, I guess? <laughs> well, it, I left them kind of vague on purpose because I I had this idea about them and I did not sketch out their, their, where they come from, what they're doing, and why they're doing what they're doing, and even exactly what they look like because I wanted to, you know, leave myself 
the room to develop that later without putting it all out for first and then having to to retcon myself. Um, but the the basic idea was that again that trope inversion thing where I was thinking, okay, what's the most common trope in military sci-fi? The aliens are, you know, the the bugs, the hive mind, and you know they get and and, and we can blast them because they don't, you know, they. But they're they're on relatively evil even terms with us in terms of physiology. I mean, they may be stronger or faster, but not so much stronger or faster that you know one person with a rifle or with you know personal weapons can't do anything against them because then you can't have a cool soldier adventure story. But so I was like, how do I kind of flip that trope around? You know, what if if most of military military sci-fi is we go up against the bugs, we try a story where we're the bugs, you know, like we are so physically inferior to them that we can't just go and approach this in a starship troopers kind of way where you know you just drop in with a whole bunch of infantry and you know you know it's just all you know gunfights and and you know blasting everything to crap and what if, what if these these aliens are so formidable that it takes a whole lot of guns to bring down just one and then you have a whole bunch of them show, showing up so where we're, where we're so physically inferior that all the tactics now I think of this like the NAC and the and the SRA have been fighting these little proxy wars on the colonies for for years and years and they're all like you know company sized actions platoon sized mm-hmm. actions because it takes a lot of money to to get material across the stars you know for you know 30 40 50 light years and and so you have all these these moons and little planets that are like that that have garrison companies maybe you know so like a few hundred soldiers or maybe tops a a regiment you know a few thousand soldiers fighting against another regiment or two and that's a big battle in that context um so you have a military that is geared toward for you geared and optimized for fighting other humans and then you put an enemy in front of them where all their doctrine and most of their equipment is is no good you know like they have to completely basically reinvent themselves in the middle of this assault by by a species that is like physically so superior to us that that you know it's it's kind of like the ultimate stress situation where you have to everything that you try out against them is going to have to be there's no trial and error here that you have time for like everything has to be tested on the battlefield basically because you don't have the you know a way to simulate that so you know they have to basically throw a whole bunch of stuff against the wall and see what sticks in the middle of of fighting for their existence and i wanted to have that scenario where we have you know such a powerful enemy that it's an existential threat and then you have the, the military the whole the whole uh, way the military makes decisions and you know with equipment and gear and training and whatever has to be flipped basically on the spot in the middle of having to fight a war and then you know also the military goes from being super selective because they have you know three billion people living in the nac and military mm-hmm. service is, is one of the few ways to get you know good food and and earn real money and maybe you know get out of the out of the you know future you know quote-unquote projects but uh then you have so many losses and and humanity is getting its its ass so comprehensively kicked in this in this whole campaign that after a few years there are so few people willing to actually jump in <laughs> and and join the fight because it's so you know it's so a, such an attrition warfare that all of a sudden then they, even the military has to change their approach and get less selective and and really strive to to get more people in with better recruiting um well not that they need, needed the recruiting to begin with but the 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 before the lankies the military is kind of like the safe bet for a for a good career that is not too dangerous because you have these little skirmishes with the SRA every now and then on yeah. some colony moon or whatever and but it's not an existential threat like it's 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 less dangerous than staying in the project so people tr- try to sign up and so the military gets to pick like they only take one out of 100 applicants and then it beca- it gets to the point you know in the matter of uh, you know two or three years it, where, where you know everybody's like the military are you crazy <laughs> we, we 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 may die still die still on earth if they invade but you know if i go out there i'm going to get killed almost for sure so the you know the military is having a hard time getting enough people and then it's just like everything kind of changes overnight and i had to have an alien that is formidable enough poses enough of an existential threat and is enough not just a hive mind of bugs 
you know, like the the, the formics or the or the uh, the bugs in, in in Starship Troopers or whatever, or the even the xenomorphs. You know, like all of this has mm-hmm. been done so often in, in military sci-fi. It's like, okay, what have I not read yet that you know we've gone up against? And then I just had this idea that was the, the, the main idea was, you know, what what if there's a war against the bugs, but we're the bugs. Yeah, I mean, I, I read these books and I, I feel like they were written sometimes specifically for me because I'm a, a huge Godzilla fan. So you, you've taken all my interests and, <laughs> I do. and merged them together. Yeah, it's been it's been great. Um, and that's something I like about the series as a whole is that it's not just the characters who who grow and change and evolve, but the military does and even the uh, the North American Commonwealth does. Um, and I'm wondering, so like reading back that that first book, uh, especially um when andrew grayson is in the territorial army and he has to he's almost shooting protesters and and rioters that reads a lot differently now than it did back in 2013 like we're getting a bit closer (laughs) to the nic ourselves here it's a little less science fiction does it does it feel a bit different writing that stuff in the current kind of political climate uh yeah always like current affairs i think always kind of influence uh, culture, especially writers, like that you're going to see, for example, you're going to see a, a crap load of pandemic fiction over the next year or two yeah. um, popping up in, in, in sci-fi. Uh, not that there wasn't some already, but this is like, this is what's on people's minds. So that naturally this is what, and I could see it in my own writing too, because as I was writing front lines, we had this, this the war in Afghanistan and Iraq going on and then just dragging on and, and, and then it became all of, the later books are about, you know, how does a soldier deal with having that sort of stress for so long and keep, he keeps getting deployed and keeps getting deployed and keeps doing these six month deployments away from, from, you know, his family. And then he, how, what effect does that have on the psyche and how many, how many military sci-fi books really address that and address the fact that, yeah, that will give you PTSD. And then this is what the effect that it's going to have on you. And what are you going to do about it? You know? Mm-hmm. So it's 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 it always current events always influence culture. It's just you don't want to be um, trying to like obviously write to a trend because then you're going to be one of like like everyone you know when when something is on vogue or something is 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 yanking on the on the collective consciousness like with the with the like I wouldn't want to write pandemic fiction right now even though that's on my mind yeah but there's no there there's no um, because I don't want it any more on my mind, you know. I want to kind of write myself out of this and have a distraction from what's going on around us. But you know, it's there's there's no doubt that this is going to have uh, going to be a trend in, in in fiction for a while. Like when when and when the pandemic hit, like all these these what was the the movie that was number one on on like Outbreak had a huge spike. In, yeah, <laughs> in, in in views because everybody's you know it was turned into a documentary. Yes, yeah. uh, but that was just in the beginning. I can, I can guarantee you, nobody's look, searching for outbreak right now because <laughs> he's sick and tired of hearing, <laughs> hearing about it. Um, so it's it's um, it's always, and especially if you have a series that goes on for a long time, you'll always be able to see how certain influences got into the storyline, and and because you can't just write the same thing all over, you know, over and over again, because then it gets boring. It's like it's it's. Uh, you know, a young man goes to war. They go to battle. They win. In the in the next book, a new enemy pops up. They go to battle. They take some losses. They win. You know, lather, rinse, repeat. And then it gets boring. It's like I, I can't tell you how many series I've quit after book three or four because they were getting repetitive. And it's like, mm-hmm. okay, if I'm going to pick up pick up book seven or eight, I know it's just going to be the same stuff as in book three or four. I mean, there, there, there's some joy to if you really like a series and you like to revisit a cast of characters, I mean, that's cool and all, but if they don't do anything interesting, then it's, it becomes boring, even if, if the characters are good. So, you know, I, I've, I've dropped a bunch of series because uh, it, I, they just didn't keep my interest anymore. And I didn't want to fall into the same trap, basically. I, I guess that kind of goes back to the idea of subverting expectations and uh, minor spoilers here for anyone who might be concerned. And I'm going to also, I'm going to get my, the names of the books confused. So, at the end of book three, in one of them, <laughs> they're they're gearing up for the uh, assault on Mars, um, mm-hmm. and I'm like, okay, that's where we're headed. But then the next book, you do this kind of great detour, um, and with that specifically, were you kind of worried people might be disappointed? Because I mean, that that story on uh, oh, what was it? Uh, Greek guy, Leonidas, Leonidas system. That's Leonidas amazing. System, yeah. yeah um, it, it, 
So, I yeah. ran out of space in the third book. Is the simple answer. The third okay. and the, the third, They were supposed to go to Mars in the third book, but I needed all the equipment that the that the uh, uh, renegades had absconded with, and I was going to get that into the third book. But you know that that is one of my flaws for as far as planning goes. Is like I tend to be too optimistic of what I can get into a chapter or into a book, and then I run over or I run out of space. So so book. Book four was supposed to basically supposed to be the second half of book three, but it had to be its own standalone book. And it still ended up being the longest book in the series because that was just such a cool setting that I had to play with and then all the stuff they had to do that it, it, it turned out the longest book in the series by about 20%. So it's 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 a, the, the biggest book of the, of the Frontline series and it was supposed to be part of book three. So it was a complete accident and, and mostly resulting from my inability to pace what I wanted to get into book three. So I had to make that detour in book four, whether I wanted to or not. Otherwise I would have just had to rush it and then it wouldn't have been any good. But uh, I think it, it turned out okay. But yes, that it's, I can see how that's a, it, it can be kind of disorienting for some readers that were expecting, okay, now we're going to Mars. And actually my, my uh, German publisher uh, bought the first four books that didn't continue the series after the first four, because I think they made a, they made a few operational errors. Like, for example, they they titled the fourth book Operation Mars, even though they don't oh. even go to Mars. <laughs> so I think that that kind of hurt the book in the market because people are like, what? This is the end and they haven't gone to Mars yet? What is this? You know, rip off. So uh, uh, it's 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 fooled more than than one person or it's 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 irritated more than one person. I think, I think it turned out pretty good. I, I like that book a lot because I do a bunch of cool stuff on that. And I wanted to have another situation where you don't do typical stuff like they they had to be vastly outgunned and just you know i i put in that technology you know the stealth technology so they're mm -hmm. just kind of like doing this 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 commando raid on on a enemy planet where they just can't just waltz in and take everything over they have to be stealthy about it and 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 wily so i th i thought it was a cool setup but but again you know then i start writing it and then i keep writing it and then i'm like whoops you know that's a whole book by itself so well, that's a shame, though, because, I mean, every single time the story's gone on one of those detours, I'm always happy it did, because it feels like it uh, not only takes the, the story in a new direction, but gives you kind of a new perspective on where things are going. So, uh, right. I don't know, it worked for me. I thought it was awesome. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, all right, so I don't want to take up too much of your time today. I'll, I'll end with just a couple more questions, if that works. Sure. Okay, so you had um, the chance to uh, see some of your short stories, both... Uh, I think a novelette from the Frontline series and also uh, an original work adapted into uh, mm -hmm. Love, Death, Plus Robots on Netflix. Um, Love, Death, and Robots, yeah. That yeah. Was, uh, uh, so when you're watching those episodes for the first time, like what's, it's, what's it like seeing your kind of worlds come to life like that? It's, it's, it's pretty wild, I got to say. It's, it's kind of surreal because, you know, reading is this, it's, it's kind of a visual media, but it's like, you know, like the, like the sticker says, reading is television in your brain. Mm -hmm. It's not a, it's not a, you know, you don't get the content presented to you, you know, st strictly visually, you make your own imagery, but, but then to see the stuff on the screen and have these, and, and they modified the, the, the second one, the, um, um, uh, the shapeshifter story. The, uh, the standalone kind of urban fantasy one that I wrote that they turned into, you know, it's basically the gist is uh, army werewolves in Afghanistan. Right. Uh, and it, was, it was a story that I wrote that was supposed to be kind of world building for a larger series that I was planning. And then I ended up selling it to, uh, to that project and they, they went and ran with it. And I really liked that. And that, that one probably sticks closer to the original material because it's, it's fairly, fairly much it's 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 kind of on the money for you know it's, it's there's not too much of a difference between it and the story whereas lucky 13 they had to change a few things around for dramatic purposes and then they had to change the name of the character because we didn't want to make it an official frontline story because we didn't want to jeopardize you know eventual you know tv rights or whatever for frontlines if there's already mm -hmm. frontlines content out there done by somebody else so it kind of like it kind of got the serial numbers filed off so to speak yeah and uh <laughs> But it's yeah, it's it's wild. You you watch that and you know you wrote the story, and the the dialogue that's coming out of the characters' mouths is 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 stuff that you wrote, and it's kind of like this surreal thing that you know it's kind of really kind of hits you. And then the um, the the, the uh, director of the one episode sent me a an email one day and kind of mentioned offhand that 
that it took 70 people six months to make that episode because it's all, you know, they, they had to do the mocap and then the animation and all that. So there's a lot of, and I'm like, wow, that story took me a week to write. <laughs> and it, it employed 70 people for six months. You know, can you imagine the salaries they had to pay out? I mean, I know what they paid for the rights, but that, that, that's like peanuts compared to what the production cost. I mean, that cost each episode in that cost, you know, well into the, the uh, seven figures. Oh, wow. And I'm like, wow, th- th- this is something that came out of my brain that I f- felt like writing down that took me kind of a week of, you know, a few hours here, a few hours there to, to, to put down. And, and they turned it into that. And now it's going to be on there like forever to stream for people and to watch. And, and you know, I, I've got my name in the credits and everything. It's just like something that you can't really, that's the first time where I realized like the broader impact that writing can have. Uh, you know, I, it's nice, you know, when people buy your books and they leave reviews and all that stuff. But it's also very, in, in terms of, and, and, and oh my god the reach like a lot of people read books but you know how many more people watch netflix than read books <laughs> like my my emails and my social media mentions and all that stuff and my and my and even the sales for the stories just went up so much after after that netflix uh you know the the series came out and i had the the, the true stories in there so i linked you know the, the netflix page to to the uh product pages on for the stories because i'm like okay of course you know i want to sell a few more stories if I point people to it, if they want to know where the source material came from, but yeah, there's just no comparison. In even even if you've sold a series that that you, I get like you know each of the Frontlines books has a few thousand reviews on on Amazon by now. So there's all and and on average like two percent of people who read a story actually leave a review and and you know so you can kind of do a back of the envelope calculation, you know how many they've sold, but it is nothing compared to how many people watch Netflix because my email just friggin' blew up after that special came out. You know, people wanting to know about the episode or leaving comments or whatever. And it's it was it's it's unreal. It's 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 just a such a difference between, you know, and, and I have friends who have had the same experience and a much grander scale. Um, you know, the Game of Thrones stuff, um, you know, the the difference that that George R. R. Martin said that's that was between the when the books were in print he was they were selling fairly well and he was doing fine but then when when they turned it into an HBO series it just got kicked into this separate universe in terms of scale and and fame and everything and then he turned into like the best known writer on the planet pretty much after after you know Harry Potter was over and and he kind of like took that over from JK Rowling like everybody knows who he is and he can't go anywhere anymore without <laughs> people mobbing him and I'm like yeah. would I would I want that and I'm happy to be a writer but I wouldn't want to be at the point where I can't go to Worldcon without, you know, having just you know bunches of of people around me. So it's 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 like I could do without the fame. I'd like the money, but I can do without the fame. But yeah, <laughs> the, the, the scales are just completely different. It's insane, and the, and yeah, it's it's the the feeling that, and you get a little taste of that. And I'm, I'm this is my stories are not you know Game of Thrones in terms of uh, viewership or whatever, but just having that little taste of what that does. To have this transfer to another medium and having so much more people exposed to it is is uh, kind of it's it's kind of awe inspiring. I mean, I guess if you were presented with that option, though, if if HBO or somebody comes up to you and, and says, you know, here's sixty million bucks, we want to make Frontlines into the next Game of Thrones or or whatever, uh, would you have to think about it or? or uh... oh. Would I have to think about it? No, I would. I would. I would tell them to where to back up the money. To be honest, <laughs> <laughs> no, I would not have to. Th- well, it's always this thing. It's like once it's out of your hands, they can do what they want with it. Like I said, the the, the two stories that I sold to Love, Death, and Robots. One of them was very close to the source material, mm-hmm. and the other one took quite a few liberties with the story. And they, and it, and it's it's Hollywood works on a different in a different way from from you know the. The, the publishing industry and that like for example um, for the, the only thing that I got negative mail for for the for the shapeshifter story on Netflix was the fact that they were in marine uniforms so they changed the characters and the story their army ah. in the in the Netflix show they're marines because you know hey marines are cooler or whatever but they still use the army lingo that I put into their mouths in the story Oh, <laughs> uh, so they're saying stuff like their supervisor, their superior refers to them as soldiers, 
and Marines do not refer to each other as soldiers. I mean, you know, they, they refer to each other as Marines. You know, it's kind of an insult if you call a Marine a soldier. And I got mail from, from Marines or former Marines who are like, oh, I love that story, but they'd never call each other soldiers. You know, it's like, <laughs> I know, I know, but nobody asked me. Like, if they had just showed me the script uh, before they ran with it, which I would have been perfectly happy to do, I could have corrected that in 20 seconds flat. You know, or if they had known, had somebody on the staff to, to proofread it who'd been in the, in the core. But that's that's one thing. Like uh, then I have to tell people I had no influence on that. I literally sold them the story, and I and I got a check, and that was it. And then the last, the next thing I saw about it was when they when the director showed me like a, a you know the first pictures, you know the the, the from, from the animations, you know the first yeah. concepts of the werewolves and stuff, and or of this Lucky Thirteen story. You know I got a, a, a first reel of like the flight through the canyons there and whatever, and it's all really cool and everything. But I didn't get a script to look at, you know, to see if they wanted to make some corrections or whatever. Because at that point they don't care. Then at that point, once they buy it and once you cash the check, it's theirs, and they can do whatever they want with it. They can rename the characters, they can tweak the story however they need it because they're buying the movie rights and they can turn it to whatever they want. So. Would I be a little concerned if somebody bought Frontlines that they were going to do justice to it? Because if they don't, you know, then they may even tank the book sales. Mm -hmm. Because you know, if if people start wa watching the series and and then it, they don't like the way it turns out, and you know, it may have a negative effect on the books. And plus, you know, it came out of your head. You want it, you want them to do justice to it. But you know, the of course, it's all a question of what are they willing to pay for it. You know, and it's like I'm I'm not going to lie that that would be. You know the financial incentive once you get past a certain amount you know it's like um especially because movie rights it's is those are like you don't have to do any extra work unless you choose to you know that it, it, the work's already done on your part all you have to do is sign a contract and get a check and that's like something that not a lot of people would turn down but i would be like i said i would be a little concerned that they do it justice and um i would probably if we were to ink you know, a movie deal for any of the series, I would probably have my involvement a little more advanced than just sign the check. Like I would be on board as like a consultant right. for the show and then just be able to review scripts and make sure that nobody does anything that's just out of character that's going to make the people who read the series go, you know, oh, come on. And I don't know how much I'd be able to, to influence I'd be able to have, but I would want to... Uh, aim for that because I do care about the story and I want it to, you know, I want them to do right by it. I mean, yeah, I, I can certainly see how getting all those emails about the uh, mistakes that you weren't involved with can be <laughs> frustrating, but yeah. I mean, it keeps me in business because I get to put out a video now saying, oh, they messed this up. That's crazy. <laughs> so it works out yeah, well for me. Please <laughs> mention that, that the fact that, <laughs> that they, they turned my, my army werewolves into Marines, but kept the army lingo is, is not my doing. Now I'll make sure to blame you specifically. So uh All right, right. Gotta yeah, get those views I, I, out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh I guess my, my last question is uh is there a question that you're tired of people asking you? Is there a question that I get tired of people asking me? Let me think of that. Yeah. Um there are some questions that come up more than others. But in general, when people ask me questions, they're like really excited about the book or the you know the, the universe and whatever, and they're not repetitive enough. Like it's not like the George R. R. Martin thing where everybody's like, you know, what, is Jon Snow alive? Or you know, like, like it's not the question that you the same question that you hear a thousand times a day, and it's not often enough where I go to cons and people ask, you know, this, this it's there's enough space between my cons and my interviews and whatever where if the same question comes up, I'd be happy to answer it again. So no, I guess there's there's none I'm really tired of yet. Well, hopefully we'll get there. maybe maybe what that says are there going to be more books? <laughs> oh yeah, are there going to be more books? Oh yeah, yeah. Awesome. I'm, 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 I finished the seventh and it's coming out in December and I am uh, turning in the eighth early next year. So it should come out in, in 2022. And I have another series that has kind of, it's going to have releases in between that because I'm contracted for two series now, but there, there will, there will also be, uh, and this is what I had intended to do all along, uh, which is why I left myself space in between the novels. I'm also planning on releasing a lot more, um, extra material like novellas and short stories in this and and i kind of left myself the room in that the the novel uh, there's a novella and a short story out so far in front lines other than the novels 
and they're both written from different perspectives than Andrew's. Mm -hmm. And I always had that in mind that I would make the shorter fiction that goes between the novels or explains the background or does more for the world building is written from other characters' point of view. So the world gets fleshed out a little more fully than just what's in Andrew's head and Andrew's opinions. So that uh, there's a lot more of that coming up in the next year. Oh, that sounds awesome. I mean, I, I'm very excited for that. Uh, I'd love to pitch you. You should write uh, from the SRA point of view because I, I love the, the Russian yeah, Cold yeah, War era I, stuff. And, I, I literally uh, have a... a um, um, I have index cards for notes here on my old fashioned cork board where I, one of them has a list on it of, uh, cause I asked my readers that uh, like last year on, or the year before on the, on my blog, I said, what kind of stuff would you like to see in the, you know, in, in short stories or novellas in the front lines world from what perspectives. And one of them was one from the SRA perspective. Oh, hell yeah. And then, you know, from the perspective of a colony that gets invaded and all that stuff. So I have a long list of, ideas for short stories and novellas where I can really go to town with that and, and look at this conflict from more angles than just one. Yeah, I mean, that sounds awesome, yeah. And maybe the main character's name is Mark Gerst, and maybe he also happens to run a YouTube <laughs> channel in addition to being... A, I'm just well, pitching it. There, yeah. the, the, the thing is, when you get Tuckerized, usually, you know, <laughs> and I've done Tuckerizations for fun with friends' yeah. names. And I've, also, I've also done Tuckerizations for charity where, you know, I've been to a con and then I raffled off uh, or they had a charity raffle and then I threw in Tuckerizations, you know, where people get to go but if once you're in the novel and I name a random soldier after you, there is no guarantee wh whether you're going to live or die. I got I to gotta warn you ahead of time. Yeah, he'll be, end up with like a horrible coward who gets stepped on by a lanky or something. <laughs> uh, yeah, so thank you so much for, for talking with me here uh, today. If, we, if we've timed this correctly, then I believe Orders of Battle should be out today on Audible and all those things. And, and I'm sure we'll, I'll include a pre-recorded thing at the end of this interview telling people where they can get that i'm gonna switch just real quick if you have an extra minute to total fan mode from interview mode okay. and saying that front lines is awesome <laughs> <laughs> i uh i was reading game of thrones and I, I went through all of that and the writing in that is just so perfect that i would go back to books i'd read previously and it just like game of thrones almost kind of ruined them for me and i, I was like oh man like do i not like books anymore and front lines was kind of the first series i got into i'm like okay yeah the writing here is at the level of, of George R. R. Martin and, and oh, like this feels you. like, yeah, it's not surprising to me that you got the chance to, to work with him. It seemed kind of, kind of inevitable from my perspective. So yeah, no, thank, thank you. you. Uh, thanks for writing that. such a great series. I am a huge fan. Um, not, not done yet, but that'll keep me writing. Cause oh, yeah, you know, please never finish. Keep, keep it going. It's such a solitary thing because the, 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 basically the job entails you sit in, a, in an empty room for most of the day and you talk to people that only exist in your head. Yeah. So it's kind of a solitary pursuit and it's nice to have that sort of feedback, you know, face to face every once in a while because it really mo motivates writers in a way you're like, OK, this is stuff that people really dig and I need to give them more of what they want. Yeah, I, when I was coming up with with questions, I had to delete half of them because like half my so-called questions were just like, this is great. Why? Why is that? <laughs> you, you, you were like, uh, you, did you ever see the Chris Foley skit on SNL when they had Paul McCartney on? And Chris Foley, when he was still, still alive, when he was doing, you know, part, part of the cast, he did, did this interview character where he asked these really aw um, awkward questions. And when he had McCartney on, it was all like him just going, remember when you were with the Beatles? That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully I didn't fall into that too much today. No, and, no, uh, you didn't. Yeah, yeah and Absolutely. I was... Uh, I was reading, again, I get all the books mixed up in my head, but uh, when um, Grayson's on one of the space stations and uh, the captain of the Indianapolis is being presented the Medal of Honor, without going into spoilers mm -hmm. here, um, I, was, I was reading that and I was like, oh, you know, this is great, but like, I wish they would include mention that the SRA would also give him the medal. That would be kind of cool. And then two seconds later, he runs into the tree <laughs> and he's yeah. like, oh, I'm, I'm like, you were right in my head. So uh, it, was, it was awesome. <laughs> Yeah, of course they would have given given him one too. And uh, yeah, that was book number four actually. That book was the four. beginning of uh, Chains of Command. Yeah, and that it, that's another thing I changed in the new series. I've got the uh, Palladium Wars out where, where in, because I had to, since you mentioned Ian, and now what order the books are in? That's probably the question that takes the longest to answer because then I have to reel them all off in order, <laughs> and there's six of them now, or seven of them now. So for the new series, I actually went the the Sue Grafton route. I stole that from her, where the first title. Is, is starts with an A, the second one starts with a B, the third one's going to start with a C, and so on until I'm through the alphabet. So I can just tell people they're alphabetical. 
you know, if, if they if they want to know the sequence. <laughs> what are you going to do when you get to X? That's going to be kind of difficult. Um, uh, X-ray oh. or xylophone. 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 Somebody. Yes. That'll Somebody's be all about gonna... the xylophone. <laughs> that sounds great. Well, thanks again for talking with me. And I hope that uh, this time next year, uh, you, you have attended Dragon Con, right? Yes. Yeah, hopefully we'll be there instead of uh, all locked yep. in our houses. I hope so too. And thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks again.